Hello, friends. Instead of a sponsor this week, we thought we'd take a moment to highlight the different resources that we are offering you from Abiding Together. First, check out our website, abidingtogetherpodcast.com. It's there that we post the episodes. We have beautiful PDFs that you can download for discussion questions so you can start your own group or share them with a friend. There's links to our one things, there's resources, and so much more. We include a calendar of our upcoming events, and we would absolutely love to meet you in person, so check it out. We also post regularly on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We have a private Facebook group where listeners can chat about the episodes, share prayer intentions, and ask podcast-related questions. So we hope you'll join us over there. For those who prefer YouTube, you can go to our YouTube channel and we post the audio from the podcast every Monday. Have you prayed about supporting the podcast but maybe don't know how? First, your prayers would mean so much to us, and we continue to pray for all of our listeners as well. Second, consider subscribing to our channel on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or leave a review. The more people who subscribe, it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Lastly, on our Patreon, you can support us financially. It takes a team effort to run this podcast and your contributions make it possible for us to hire staff who manage the marketing and operations. Even $15 would make a difference. You can go to patreon.com slash abiding together podcast. We are so grateful for each of you. God bless. Well, hello, dear friends, and welcome to season 12 of the Abiding Together podcast. We are so excited to be back with you for another season. Abiding Together is a place where you can find connection, rest, and encouragement on your journey with Jesus Christ. And we have people from all over the world on this walk together, and you are most, most welcome. My name is Sister Miriam James, and every week I'm joined by two of my very dearest friends, Michelle Benzinger and Heather Kim, and we speak about what the Lord is doing in our life, the movements of the Holy Spirit, what is breaking our hearts, what is healing us, and where the Lord is leading us to deeper relationship with Him. So wherever you find yourself today, wherever that is, you are most welcome. So grab a cup of coffee, settle in, and welcome home. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Abiding Together podcast. Our first, unless I'm totally mistaken here, isn't this our first summer series ever in the history of Abiding Together? I think so. I can't remember. I mean, this is like, we're crazy. I think we did in the School of the Holy Spirit in June, but I can't remember. Yeah. We're living on the edge. Seriously. Like, look at us. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a a little summer sneak attack. Exactly. Because everybody's like, oh, and we did this on purpose to like put this in the dog days of summer where you've run out of things to do and there's nothing else to do. So (laughs) Mm -hmm. can we Mm -hmm. please read a post-synodal apostolic exhortation? Well, yes, we can. And we are going to do that. (laughs) And so we're going to read uh, Christy Fidelis Laichi, which is the lay members of Christ's faithful people. And that was written by Pope John Paul II. And so good. We're going to go week by week. And so we're going to talk about the introduction today and part one, which is I am the vine and you are the branches. So... Michelle and Heather, what do you guys think? Just maybe Michelle for you, what's your thoughts as we kind of dive into a epistolic exhortation, which I don't even know if we've ever done one of those before. We've done all kinds of cool things on the podcast, but this is such a great document and I think it's going to so empower people and so help illumine people's hearts and their call to holiness. Yeah, I just, we had to read this document back in theology school catechesis at Franciscan. Heather and I did with Sister Johanna. Shout out to Sister Johanna. Ooh. And so, but rereading it 25, uh, yeah, a lot later than we first read it before. <laughs> at least, at least five years ago. At least five years yeah. ago. <laughs> at least, at yeah. least. Yeah. It's just so interesting how it hits this time, how it is, and how it is so important this time really for the lay faithful to rise up and to become. And it just made me love John Paul II even more, his prophetic voice, Mm -hmm. his deep prophetic voice, and how he used his voice to really lead the church. I mean, his whole pontifical mission was to lead the church into the third millennium. And I feel like his work now is coming, starting to really, it's always born fruit. But right now I feel like it is just beginning to bear abundant fruit, you know, his writings and all of that. And really just almost to put a fire in my belly, like for the lay faithful to really be salt and light, really to be salt and light and to go out into the world. What about you, Heather? Yeah, it's been so good to read it again. And I think just that reminder, one, there's a sense of urgency as you read it that you hear like in the, in the words, but it's such a, a good, like, awakening call. That's how I was experiencing it as I was reading it. It was like, get out of your slumber. You need to be wide awake because there's a lot to do and, and not just like to do stuff, you know, but like, it's a wonderful participation in the mission of Christ. And how are we supposed to be engaging in that? And it's so easy to just slip into kind of this, uh, yeah, sleepy, like malaise, like for that to just sort of settle over us and to just be concerned about the things that we can see right in front of us. 
instead of like, oh, wow, there's a bigger mission at play here that we're all called to participate in, no matter what our stage of life is. So I just loved reading it again. I was like, yes. Like mm-hmm. At every point I was like, oh, I love this so much. Especially mm-hmm. like as they talk about the universal call to mm-hmm. holiness. Oh, that was awesome. How about you, sister? Well, I think I, I agree with both of you so deeply. And I I think we're often remiss in even knowing the deep riches of our church and the, what our church gives us. And I'm, I'm always interested in kind of like, where do things come from? And so I haven't read this document in a long time, probably since I was in formation, which was <clears throat> at least five years ago <laughs> and uh, myself. And so I was like, where does this even come from? And so this document actually comes from, it's a response to the 1987 Synod of Bishops. So this document was written in 1988 and it's amazing how prophetic mm-hmm. it is. Like when you look at mm-hmm. it and you read it now, you're like, holy cow, even more so now. Now is the time such as this for lay people to be salt and light to the world. But in the very introduction, Pope John Paul II talks about how the, the theme of vocation and mission in the church and in the world 20 years after the Second Vatican Council, he said, was the topic of the 1987 Synod of Bishops. So this document comes from that. And so, yeah, what is the church, what is the church saying and kind of where are we going from here? And the whole thing is set in the atmosphere and in the environment of a vineyard, which I love. Mm -hmm. And he talks about Matthew 20. So where Jesus tells the parable of, you know, for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And so it's, like he talks about how all of us are to, are to go into the vineyard. He's like, why do you stand here idle all day? All of us are to, to go into the vineyard. And it's not just, there is a section certainly on church service, which we're going to talk about probably next week, but not just, okay, I'm going to go be a Knights of Columbus or I'm going to go, you know, help with the altar society, which is important. But he's like, no, no, you go out into the world. Mm-hmm. Like you go out into the world, like you got to bring Christ to the world. And I, I agree with both of you. It was like, I was like, this is so good. I just sat in my chair with my little highlighter. I was like, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Yeah. It's awesome. And I think even in the introduction, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. here we go. Like, there, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like there's no time wasted. So I just want to encourage people, if this is your first time reading a church document, you might be like, whoa, what's all these Latin words and like what's going on? Or maybe you're not Catholic and you're reading something like this for the mm-hmm. first time. Just take it as you can. You know, there's so mm-hmm. much you don't have to understand every, you know, the gravity of every part of it. But I think that there is something in here for all of us to press into. It's good to challenge ourselves. It's good to challenge our minds and our hearts and to listen to this prophetic voice that is coming through in this document for sure. Yeah. And I love it. He starts in the, like what sister, what you were saying, he just packs a punch from, even from the introduction, yeah, yeah. you know, he talks about go out into the vineyard, go. And at the time that we are recording this now, like I'm just telling you in real time, we just celebrated the feast of Pentecost and just the mm-hmm. ho- power of the Holy spirit coming upon them to go and make disciples. And he says, go out into the vineyard, but he says, do not remain idle. I mean, he was like, do Mm -hmm. not remain idle. And I was just even thinking like, okay, there's a scripture. Idleness is the handiwork of the devil. And we don't Mm -hmm. want to strive or earn or do everything, but he frames it in a way we want to abide in Jesus, Mm -hmm. but to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love that I looked up the definition Mm -hmm. of idle. And one of the definition was to run at low power and often disconnected usually. So the power is not used for useful work. And I was like, that isn't a great definition because isn't that us? Like we are not connected to the vine, you know, and we're not going out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're still trying to do things in our own power where John Paul II mm-hmm. at the very beginning, he's like, go, do not remain idle, but abide in the vine, abide in Jesus, like become mm-hmm. who you are is what he is saying. Become the lay faithful. Yeah. The time is now for the lay faithful to go out into the world because I really even feel like even the last probably three to six months, it's gotten darker. Oh it has gotten darker. It's like someone has a dimmer on a light switch, you know, in the just the dimmer is going darker and darker. You know, I've just seen some of the situations my kids have been put in in the last six months and things that have been brought to their attention. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, as we dive deeper in, he's just talking about how Jesus is the hope for humanity. But we as Christians are the ones that have to carry that hope. We have to be the life bearers and bring that hope within us and out to the world. So Mm -hmm. buckle up, people. Here we go. (laughs) And it's true, Michelle, like as you're talking about that, I'm like the tendency to just stay and hunker down and like close all the hatches and close all the doors and just stay in to protect ourselves from Mm -hmm. the darkness of the world. It's very, very tempting, I think, especially right now, because you Mm -hmm. can see the utter chaos and destruction that's happening out there. But that's not our call as Christians is to just hunker down. It is to go out and make disciples of all nations. That is the call from the, from our baptism. So, Mm -hmm. and I appreciate that he spends so much time in the introduction and in the first 
part about talking about baptism and how all of it's done in mm-hmm. Christ. This is not us trying to reinvent something or God in our own power or conjure up like a new program. It is living the it is living the call to discipleship. It's living the call to holiness in Christ, that he is the vine, we're the branches. And that we're and the church, he talks about the church is the vine mm-hmm. as well. Like it's Christ's heart, it's his life. So this is lived out. I, I just love the whole section on baptism of of who we are as mm-hmm. baptized Christians. And and even before that though, in the introduction on page, I guess it's number five, depending on what document you're working for, that's online or it's the physical copy. He talks about the sacredness of the human person. I love that line. And the need to reaffirm the sacredness mm-hmm. of the human person. He said, but the sacredness of the human person cannot be obliterated no matter how often it is devalued and violated because it has its unshakable foundation in God as creator and father. The sacredness of the person always keeps returning again and again. And then he talks about the difference between subject and object and things and people. And this is where do we first learn this? We first learn this in our family of origin. Mm -hmm. We first learn this Every single person learns or we learn something about that, but the continued affirmation of the sacredness of the human person by the church and by the family, by mom and dad, by civilization, by members of the church of like, you are sacred. You are made in the image likeness of God. You are a baptized Christian. This is your mission. There's a call that responds to that relationship. Every relationship has a mission with it. And that's so, that's such good news. Cause that means we're not having to try to take on something of ourselves or like kind of conjure up some sort of zeal. This is us living out the truth of our reality as baptized Christians. Mm. Yeah. And I think something that was coming to mind for me was like, well, it says here at the beginning of chapter one, it says through the church, we abide in Christ only from the inside. The church's Mm. mystery of communion is the identity Mm. of the lay faithful made known and their fundamental dignity revealed only within the context of this dignity. Can their vocation and mission in the church and the world be defined? And I was like, you know, even just on one level, we're not slaves, to God. Like he's not saying just go out and be laborers. We're actually part of the vineyard. Like we're abiding yes. in deep communion and relationship with him and, and that it's coming from our, the deepest part of our identity and our, mm-hmm. and our dignity. It's all tied together. So God isn't just saying, go out and do all this stuff. I'm, I'm commanding you to go out and do all this stuff so that you can get into my good graces or, or however we might somehow envision that God, yeah, like pushes us with harshness. Mm-hmm. But this is actually tied to our deep dignity and that we're a mm-hmm. part of a body. We're part of his body. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it builds so beautifully upon what we studied in our Lenten study. Yes, with Bob. I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I was just thinking like the sacramental power, the sacramental power of baptism. I feel like if our identity is so deeply rooted in our baptism and so deeply rooted in priest, prophet, and king, and if we as the lay faithful live into the fullness with the power of the Holy Spirit, Uh, our priest, prophet, and king roles, like that is a game changer. Mm -hmm. That is what transforms the world. And I was just really convicted and I've been really convicted. May was just a kick butt month, like on many levels. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of, there's always a lot of activity, especially for those of us that have children when, I mean, can we fit in any more celebrations (laughs) and different things and whatever in one month. And, but also there's just a couple of big things happen with certain children where we just saw some really big holes in their identity. Chris and I were looking at it. Mm -hmm. So Chris and I had to just take a step back and look, okay, like where have we been idle in forming our own children? I mean, part of it is they have free will, so they're making their own decisions, so they have responsibility also. But part of us is us. I'm like, okay, they don't know who they are in this and the Lord. They don't know who they are in their identity. That comes back to us as the, you know, the principal formators for kids. And I would just been really, really convicted of just like even speaking blessing over my kids. Like we've talked about this Mm -hmm. multiple times on the podcast, but the power of blessing and calling forth who they are with our words out loud. And one of the things I was just thinking, our words create worlds. You know, that's how it's began in Genesis. And that's how it's beginning now. Like, okay, what am I speaking into my family? What am I speaking into my culture? How am I living my prophet role in my baptismal call? Speaking Mm -hmm. forth words of life. I've just been more convicted than ever, the power of words of blessing and not curses as we live out this Mm -hmm. baptismal call. What about y'all? Well, and I, I think, yeah, what you're sharing is actually literally in number nine, when it talks about, you know, who are the lay faithful and what is our mission? And it talks about how a full belonging of the lay faithful to the church and to its mystery. At the same time, it insisted on the unique character of their vocation, which is in a special way to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and ordering them to the plan of God. And it talks about how Lumen Gentium says, it is here 
the lay faithful understood to mean all the faithful except those in holy orders and those who belong to a religious state sanctioned by the church through baptism. So every single person though, the lay faithful are made one body with Christ and are established among the people of God. They are in their own way, made shares in the priestly prophetic and kingly office of Christ. And they carry out in their own part in the mission of the whole Christian people with respect to the church and to the world. And so I think all of us, you know, in our, whatever kind of family we are, religious community, whatever we do in life, I think we're always waiting for other people to, well, you know, if you would take the lead or if I would, if those people would kind of change or if this, but it's, it's really the, the Holy Father and the church inviting us to live into the truth of, of who we are. And this reflection on the baptism and on our state and, you know, on our state in life, but also just the mission from our sacramental life. Oh, it's such good news. I, I just think it's such good news. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't count the number of times that people say to me, Heather, you know what you should do? And they want to put more things on my list because (laughs) they might look at me as like, well, I'm in ministry in the church or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my question always is like, what what if you did it? (laughs) What what if you did it? What if you used to end? There's usually like a look of like shock of like, well, I couldn't possibly, you know, and you can see in there this hesitation of like, I couldn't possibly do that because I'm not equipped to do that or I don't have all these gifts or whatever it might be. And I think we underestimate what God can do and what he mm-hmm. has done through our baptism and confirmation that we actually are equipped with supernatural power to do things far beyond what we think we could do. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think any of the three of us thought we could do, or even still think we can do anything good. Can, you know, no. like mm-hmm. it's only through the power of God and his grace active in our life and all of that, that we can do anything that is fruitful. And so I, I say mm-hmm. that just as like a, a consolation in a way, but also don't let the enemy convince you mm-hmm. that you aren't equipped to do the work of God in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It isn't just for people in ministry. It isn't just for a select few or, you know, who have a shiny package or who, who know how to speak eloquently. Like the Lord has called everyone, the sinners, the people who are broken apart. Gosh, that's why he called us, you know, like he he's calling the meek and the lowly and those mm-hmm. who maybe aren't very gifted to be his hands and feet in the world. And, and our equipping comes from our baptism and our confirmation in the sacramental life of the church fed by the Eucharist so that we can yeah mm-hmm. live out this mission. Mm-hmm. And I love And I've been more convicted than ever. I think I mentioned, I can't remember y'all. Sorry, people. Like I told you, May took it out me. I can't remember what happened, but there I've been reading a book and I'll, reference it again, Contemplative Hunger. And it's just been a really amazing book. And he calls for, in this book, the priest calls for a lay revolution of prayer. He said, if we really want to mm. see the church rise up and become who she is, it's a lay revolution of prayer. Not to say that the priest and the religious, mm. amen, they are too, but mm. it's this combination, mm-hmm. you know, that the bride responds to the bridegroom in this beautiful dialogue and pray forth. And which I was really thinking of, like, yes, we can talk about the prophetic part of our baptismal call, or we can talk about, you know, the kingly part, but really the priestly part of our baptismal call, which is to pray, mm-hmm. you know, and to really pray. And I love what he said in the document when he says, the lay faithful are sharers in the priestly mission for which Jesus offered himself on the cross and continues to be offered in the celebration of the Eucharist for the glory of God and the salvation of humanity. And he says, going down a little, he says, speaking of the lay faithful, the council says for their work, prayers and apostolic endeavors, their ordinary married and family life, their daily labor, their mental and physical relaxation, it F carried out in the spirit and even the hardship of life, it patiently born spiritual sacrifices, it's spiritual fruit. He's just saying, mm-hmm. even our ordinary, you know, if in the power of the Holy Spirit, it brings forth fruits mm-hmm. and abundant life. And I think that is like just such a conviction, but also exciting. We are on mission mm-hmm. with the Holy Spirit. Like you were saying, Heather, we didn't think we could do this. The Lord is calling you. Mm-hmm. It's kind of that create the things that you wish existed. Yeah. Why mm-hmm. don't we have this? Why don't we have this? Okay. If the Lord is putting that stirring or like putting his finger on something, then you probably are supposed to be part of the solution. You know, if you can see the problem, the Lord is inviting you to partner with him, the Holy Spirit to be part of the solution. So what is that? But how do we do that? First and foremost, we have to pray. Say, Holy Spirit, what are you asking of me? We have to be quiet. We have to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And then we have to move and not be idle. Yeah, it, it's easy to sit back and point out all the things that need help or are wrong or are lacking in the church. It's very easy to do that. And I think we all fall into that, you know, mm-hmm. to varying degrees. It's much harder, you know, to say, wow, to ask those questions. How can I be part 
of not just a solution, but like, how can I participate to help? Yeah. What, what more can I do, Lord? I think that's the question. What, well, how, are, how are you asking me to respond to the needs that I see? And I think there's a gift in our sensitivity there. If we're, being, if we're feeling a sensitivity towards something that's lacking or, or not right, or maybe there's a hole, maybe you look around and you go, wow, there's no youth ministry here and we have young people who are hungry. Well, that sensitivity is a gift from God and I would pay mm-hmm. attention to those things. Mm-hmm. I appreciate also what you both are talking about. This it's lived out in the ordinary mm-hmm. life, the ordinary, the ordinary way of life. And in number 15, it talks about lay people says they live in the ordinary circumstances of family and social life from which the very fabric of their existence is woven. They are persons who live an ordinary life in the world. They study, they work, they form relationships as friends, professionals, members of society, cultures, etc. However, the, the council considers our condition not simply an external and environmental framework, but as a reality destined to find in Jesus Christ the fullness of its meaning. So it's lived out in Jesus, like the, the later quote, uh, Christ is, Jesus chose to live the life of an ordinary craftsman in his own time and place. Mm-hmm. And for all the ways we say, well, I'm just the, this person, or I'm just this, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just a mom, or I'm just a whatever, I'm just a, and it, just wondering where is where is Jesus inviting us to live out his life in our ordinary ways of life and bringing Christ into the world? Like we, as a religious sister, there's certain things that I can do that nobody else can do. But as lay people, there's certain things that y'all, you guys reach people that I could never reach who would never, I'm not in places of work. I'm not at Taylor Swift concerts. I'm not, you know, all the different things. Like I don't do things like that. And so it's like, you guys reach people, you bring Christ to people, you bring Christ in the day-to-day life that is so powerful. And if that's not there, Nobody else is going to do that in politics, in d- small business owning, like all, all the different things of, you know, the carpool, the co-op, the, the soccer moms, like there's just so much that God has not left us orphaned or abandoned or like, well, this is, you know, this is good as it's going to get. You just kind of have to suck it up. It's like, no, what is the, yeah, what is the mission God is calling lay people to, to bring him to the world, partnered with, with, with Jesus, not by yourself, but with Jesus like that. There's a place in the vineyard only you can bring Christ to. And mm-hmm. that's so important to find that place. Yeah, it's right. It's true. And and it might not look like a classic ministry role. You know what I mean? Like where you're like working yeah. at a church or you're you're running some kind of program. And in fact, I think this is the most fruitful thing is when it's just mm-hmm. coming in your natural place where God <laughs> in your in your natural habitat, you know, in in the natural places where the Lord has you that you would use your gifts, the relationships that he's helping to build amongst people, you know, in the business world. Like I have friends who have started you know, groups like for business people to help them grow and to come to know Christ. And it is amazing what can be done. And that's where the world needs us most, right? Isn't, it's not necessarily like those of us in the pews. Yes, we need, we need to be ministered to and, and called to greater holiness, but it is in the periphery where people are really struggling with a tremendous amount of darkness that they might just need your loving words, your loving presence to be there preaching can look like a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily look like you're standing with a Bible in front of a group of people. It can just look like love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think he goes on to say like in part 16, where he's like, there's a call to holiness. There's an invitation to holiness. And he says, holiness is the greatest testimony of the dignity conferred on a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. And holiness is attractive. Mm -hmm. Like when it is lived in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, because it bears fruit, it is that's like what you were saying, Heather, it is gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, you know, self-control. There's something attractive about it. And where it almost is like this beautiful light and there is the beauty and truth and goodness about it. So people want to lean in and say, okay, what's different about this person? And not to be showy and not to be like put a person on a pedestal or anything like that, but that there's a peace about them. There is something that anchors them. There's a light in their eyes and not, not, our lives are not going to be perfect. There is always going to be messy. I keep on thinking, I still fall into this thing after this, then this will happen. Like, okay, no, like it's Mm -hmm. all going to be just messy and crazy, you know, on the side of heaven, but holy. Holiness is attractive. Holiness is light. Holiness mm-hmm. calls people forth. And so a real call to holiness for each and every one of us. I feel like when I was reading this part, I feel like the Lord is just extending myself and even the church, like this big invitation, like this call to holiness. That's what the Second Vatican Council was. The universal call to holiness. It's not just for priests and religious. It's for all of us. I think one of the most beautiful things is the Basilica in Washington, D.C. And it says the universal call to holiness etched in that marble at the very top of it. Like it is this 
beautiful prophetic call right now. Like the Lord is sending us this beautiful invitation again. You're called to be holy and set apart. Open the invitation. RSVP. Say, I'm coming. Like, sanctify me, Lord. Sanctify me, Holy Spirit. I'm coming. In the soil of surrender, going back to the vineyard talk, what do I need to surrender? What do I need to let go of so you can transform me? Yeah. And holiness, I think sometimes can be a, people can get a little bit confused. It's like, well, what does that mean? And how do I become holy? And I love in 17, I I just took this personally, although it is just talking about the church as well, but it says only in the measure that the church, Christ's spouse is loved by him Mm, and she in turn loves him. Does she become a mother fruitful in the spirit? And I took that personally. I was like, it's only in the measure that I allow him to love me and I love him back. Do I become a fruitful, fruitful, a mother fruitful in the spirit? You know, I think it is about that. Like all the works that we do, it doesn't matter if it's not connected to, I am trying to love Christ with my whole heart and I'm allowing him to love me, to transform those parts of me that are maybe disordered, you know, within that, that something good has been twisted in the way that I live. And so holiness, again, looks like love. <laughs> it looks like allowing our love for him to be expressed in, in the way that we conduct ourselves and conduct our life. I was, I was literally going to read that very thing. Me too. That's awesome. Yeah. That's okay, go. Like, what are your thoughts? I want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I was going to read the whole paragraph and it just, it's so beautiful because it says holiness then must be called a fundamental presupposition and an irreplaceable condition for everyone mm. in fulfilling the mission of salvation within the church. The church's holiness is the hidden source and the infallible measure of the works of the apostolate and of the missionary effort. And then it goes on to say the sentence that you so beautifully brought out, Heather, right? That going back to the vineyard, going back to life in Christ, going back to there is no other way Mm -hmm. other than through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is just once again, this is not us trying to conjure up a ministry or trying to do works outside of Jesus. It's only being grafted and living into as branches on the vine that that works. And so there we can't wait for other people to be holy so that we can become holy. It's, it's us going on that mission of allowing ourselves to be loved and to be transformed and to be about that work and to be about the domestic church and the family. And, you know, how does like each family has a culture and each family has a ministry and a mission too. It's kind of, so there's just so much in there that is so important for us to remember. And I I just want to say, as we kind of maybe close here, I, so we can be, like you said so beautifully, Heather, at the very beginning, we can be overwhelmed by church documents, but I just want to invite people really to give this one a try because it's not an academic writing. It is, you know, a little bit more technical in many ways, but even if all you can do is take it paragraph by paragraph, I think you'll be richly blessed because most of us have no idea the treasures of our church and it's just easy for us to overlook them or to look someplace else. But our church is so rich and so much beauty that is given to us from the heart that we have, it's, we sit on a treasure chest we don't even know about. So I just, I just want to also encourage our listeners too. Like it's, even if it's a little bit different for you, the writing is a bit more technical. Oh my gosh, stick with this one, stick with it. Cause I think you're really going to love it. Mm-hmm. And the church is worth listening to with your own ears. Amen. Yes. Not somebody else's interpretation of what she's saying, because that can get Amen. mangled up really mm-hmm. quick. Like just mm-hmm. listen to what she's saying. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Michelle, what were you going to add? I was just going to add at the very beginning, I mean, the very end of the first chapter, what St. Augustine says, he quotes St. Augustine and says, let us rejoice and give thanks. We have not only become Christians, but Christ himself. Stand in awe and rejoice. We have become Christ. And I just read Mm -hmm. that. And like I was saying before, I was just really convicted this past month, like when we were dealing with situations with two of our kids, like this is going to make me cry. I was telling Chris, like, have we just talked about the moral law of the church and we've not talked about the passion relationship of Christ. And so that's all of our kids see, Mm. because it says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Like if you're not obeying commandments, we have a love problem, not an obedience problem. Mm. And like, do I allow my love affair with the Jesus and the church spill over to everyday life? It's fine to say it in a podcast, but do I like, Mm. how do I let it allow it to come forth my everyday life? And just real conviction about that this past month. And just saying that to our listeners, like, we are so on the journey with you. We are just trying to all figure this out. You know, what does holiness look like in everyday life? It's easy to be holy in a podcast or on the stage or whatever. It's harder to be holy Mm -hmm. in the grocery store line or on the soccer field, especially if there's a bad call from Mm -hmm. a ref. Like, it's harder, you know? Or someone cuts you off, I know. Exactly, you know? (laughs) It's just like, okay, but... This is what the invitation, it's an invitation of love, like what you were saying, Heather, that quote in the last part, 
I just stopped dead in my tracks also. Mm, It's just like an invitation Mm. to love. And what is our response? Like we'll go out to the vineyard with our beloved. Mm -hmm. We will respond. Yeah, there's so much to chew on, even in this very first episode, in this first chapter, in the introduction, so much to chew on and to pray about. And so we we just hope that this walking, you know, hand in hand in, through this document is a blessing to you. And take time to have conversations about it. Take time to please post on our, our private Facebook group or just we'd love to have discussions or post on, you know, just the different um, posts from social media. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what this stirs in you. And for many of us, this is the first time we've ever read anything like this. I mean, remember, maybe never even read a church document, been Catholic our whole life, or maybe not even Catholic and never read a church document. So welcome, please, please come and just see and, and learn and listen. Like, and it, yeah, it's like Heather was saying, let's listen, let's listen what the church says. Listen to, let's let her speak and listen to mother church and receive from her, from the fount of wisdom and allow that to wash over us and to transform us. So this is exciting. Ladies, so good, so so good. Well, uh, are we going to do summer one things? We didn't really talk about this. Are we going to do summer one things. Or are we going to do summer? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Beach floaties. I, I, I don't. Oh, okay, I Heather. Two. What you got, girl? What you got? Yeah, I'll dive in. I'll dive in because I'm really excited about these two things. So the first one is our dear friend Lisa Brennickmeyer hmm. sent me something that might be one of the greatest gifts I've ever received, other than you know what the Lord has done, but. <laughs> The Ember Mug. <laughs> I give oh. you the Ember Mug, which is this digital mug that keeps your coffee or tea warm for like an hour. You don't and say. you get to set the exact temperature that it that you want it to stay at. So this entire time we've been recording and I just had half a cup of coffee sitting here. It is just as hot as when I poured it. And wow. I this is amazing. So mm-hmm. Lisa Brennick Meyer, shout out mm-hmm. to you for being such a great friend who cares about the temperature of my coffee. <laughs> So no more rewarming, no more microwaving your coffee. Um, So that was awesome. The next one, which I am very excited about, is a new little book. It's just a small book that our dear friend, Bishop Scott McKaig, Mm. he's a Canadian bishop. He's a Canadian bishop for the military. He wrote a book called Clothed with Power from on High, a short catechesis on charisms in the life and mission of the church. It goes along so well with what we're talking about today in our previous episode on charisms. So he's talking about how charisms are a part of God's plan for the whole church and how each of us are called to fulfill the great commission that Jesus has given us. So it's a short read. I love Bishop Scott. I love his voice in the church. I think the urgency, but the passion and love for Jesus that he speaks with. So anyway, check it out. It's on Amazon or wherever you get books, the Catholic Mm -hmm. books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, you got one? Yeah, I got one. It is a book by Teresa and Peter Martin called The Rule, St. John Paul II's Rule for a Joy-Filled Marriage and Divine Love. It is a really amazing book about, and they just translated it into English, John Paul II's writings that this is all kind of like his format that he used to form young couples when they were getting married when he was back in Poland. And it is so good. It is so good and it is beautiful. And so I'm going to put two things. I'm going to put a link to the book and then Word on Fire had a great article about the book and just explained it. I'll put both those in the show notes. Mm. And then my other one thing is a song from Todd Galberth and Tasha Cobbs called Fear Is Not My Future. And I mean, y'all, I've been playing it every day on my walk and just declaring, I mean, it is church, y'all. It is gospel. It is church. You love that Tasha I mean, Cobbs. I you love, love her. Tasha Cobbs. I even <laughs> said to my oldest daughter, I'm like, she needs to be my friend. Like, she really needs to be my friend. <laughs> Like, yes, like I want her, like her voice has such power, but there is this line, you know, fear is not my future. You are. And then she has another line. It says, heartbreak is not my home. You are. And it is just like, it is like a declaration. Let's praise God. It's church. It's a good old song. And so, yeah, I'll put both those. (laughs) Sister, what about you? Well, I just have one, one thing, and it is a wonderful ministry by uh, a layman named John Edwards, and the ministry is called Just a Guy in the Pew. And he does a lot of work with men, and he teaches men how to have a men's ministry. He goes parish missions, and he has a podcast, and he has a, his own credible story of addiction and, and conversion and just nearly losing everything mm. and really losing everything, and then Christ coming to redeem him. And so he's out of Memphis, Tennessee, and just a wonderful human being, just such a great guy, and he just loves just men into wholeness and freedom. So if you're looking for just awesome. a good ministry for men that it has like four different kind of pillars that they talk about. So I would just highly recommend, yeah, just a guy in the pew by John Edwards. Yeah. I'm just imagining every wife like scribbling <laughs> down like, the information. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what'd you say? Just yeah. let me get that down. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, it's great. He's really lovely. So, so yeah, just a guy in the pew. So I want to give a shout out to John Edwards and all that he does to to lift men closer to Christ. It's just a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. It's awesome. Well, friends, we shall see you next week for part two on our series. We're going to have a five-part series on Crucifidella's Lychee. You can download this on the internet for free. You can buy it if you want a hard copy of it. Super simple. You don't have to wait for shipping like in that regard. You can, you can read it online or print it off today like the old school printer. We just wanted to do a document that everybody could have access to instantaneously. So keep going, and we will see you on the journey. So until next week in the hot summer sun, we will be abiding together. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you liked it, would you please share it with a friend and leave us a review? We encourage you to head over to our website, abidingtogetherpodcast.com, where you can find all the show notes, links to our one things, group discussion questions for each episode, and beautiful coffee mugs, t-shirts, journals, and prints in our shop. There you can also subscribe to receive our weekly email with links to each new episode and all of the content. We'd love to connect on social media and invite you to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter so you can catch inspiring reflections every day. You're also welcome to join our private Facebook group and dive deeper into discussions with our fellow listeners. If the podcast has blessed you, would you prayerfully consider financially supporting us? The Body Together podcast is only available due to the generous support of our listeners. There are significant costs associated with creating this content, such as tech support, design, website, equipment, and hired staff that we need to be able to continue offering great content. Abiding Together is a nonprofit 501c3, and all donations are tax deductible. You can make donations of any amount through the Patreon website, or you can send us a check directly if that's easier for you. If you donate $15 or more per month on our Patreon page, you become a tribe member and you will receive bonus content every month, such as recipes, music playlists, downloadable prints, and more. You can find all the information at patreon.com slash abidingtogetherpodcast. Thank you so much and God bless you.